welcome to the festive special. It's always tricky getting the material for these things, so I thought I'd do something different. Here is your computer from December 1983. And what if, I thought, I used this to make a normal episode? You know, news, reviews, chat, but all based on the Christmas 1983 issue of this magazine. Oddly, there's not a lot of festive material in here, so I'll be interspersing this video with a few festive tidbits, like this. The Christmas Cracker Simulator from Text Voyage with added effects and sound. But before we actually begin, the cover really sets the festive mood. It does, but it's a bit rubbish, isn't it? What? It's, it's, it's got the man himself. Well, it has, but with, what, a snow globe? What's that got to do with computers? But what we should talk about is the crash ones, because they were great. I mean, the original one with all the Christmas giving away presents to all the aliens. I really like that cover. I think that's probably my, my favourite crash Christmas cover. Yeah, the next year, so issue 24, had, again, Father Christmas giving away presents to one alien. Okay, I'm spotting a trend. I like the black and white one. Very busy. Yeah, it is very busy. But then again, you can spend time looking at it in great detail and finding different things. Yeah, I think that was a really, really good one. I think that's my favourite Crash Christmas cover. Is that Brian Clough? Father Christmas does look remarkably like Brian Clough, doesn't he? <laughs> it does say, win a football fortune... Ah, that was Brian Clough's fo Football Fortunes game. I don't like this one, the Pac-Man opening the champagne. No, no. There's not a lot of detail in it, is there? The others have got really detailed backgrounds and lots of things happening. Yeah, and then, then after that, they seem to go away from... Chris they had a Christmas special written on it and a bit of snow on top of the Crash logo. But then a helicopter. Yeah, and then what was the next year's? Same, same kind of thing again, so... They seem to. They definitely seem to get away from the Christmas theme. But I guess once you've done Father Christmas doing a few things, it's really difficult to come up with more Christmassy covers. Anyway, we've moved away from your computer. I think we should get back. We have. We better get back. And on to the news. However, there is no news relating to the Spectrum in this issue. So we're going to look at what the magazine predicts for the future, or at least the next 12 months, in an article called Spirit of Christmas to Come. I'll go through a few of them, Jeff, and see what you think. The first one. One year on, many micros will be half price, they say, with the Commodore 64 being 99.95, and the Spectrum not hitting the 50%, but selling for around £70. It never got that low, did it? What actually happened was the Commodore 64 was £199 and the 48k Spectrum was £125 a year on. Which was a good price. But didn't the, didn't the 16k get down to 69 or something like that? But I think they were selling them off because not many were buying the 16k. There are many other new micros to arrive, they say, including Sinclair's business model, the QL, but as yet it hadn't been named. And they say that the QL may fend off other manufacturers if the price is right and if it doesn't include microdrives. They say businesses do not want them, they want industry standard storage, which is quite acceptable, really. Sinclair should have listened to him, shouldn't he? Well, he should have read the magazine, really. I mean, microdrives were good at the time, but not really for business use, I wouldn't have thought. They say later models of the Spectrum will come with a cartridge port will have a joystick port built in, and come with 64k of RAM. Well, none of those really happened to the machine. I mean, you could buy extra bits, but... Hmm. Oh, almost the interface too, there. Almost the interface too, without the RAM. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that they, they could have put RAM on the interface, really. They could have. The RAM came later anyway. Yeah, and, and some Spectrums, I, I'm sure, the, the, some Spectrums, because they used... Um, low-grade chips, some of them that had been downgraded. Some of them actually had 64k in there, but it, it wasn't enabled. 16k of it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Carry on with the storage thing, and they say many micros will see new peripherals like mini disk drives, especially now that the five and a quarter inch drives are coming down in price. That kind of happened for the Spectrum, didn't it? 
Well, the Spectrum didn't have any disk drives initially, and then the, there was a flood of lesser-known ones like the Clive drive and the Byte drive 500. And the Opus. Yeah, but they weren't five and a quarters, so they were mainly either three or three and a half. Was there a five and a quarter for the Spectrum? There were several disk interfaces that supported five and a quarter inch drive, things like the SBDOS and the Kempston disk interface. They all supported five and a quarter inch drives. And the good thing about the five and a quarter is that, aptly named, they were actually floppy. They were, indeed, yes. However, the main problem was a five and a quarter inch drive at that time, and even later on, was more expensive than the Spectrum. On to communications, and they say, Telecom Gold and other communications in general will increase and become more popular. And they predict that electronic mail will become a big thing. I got that wrong, didn't he? Who uses that? <laughs> Nobody uses electronic mail anymore. This isn't a bad prediction, actually, all things considered. Mice. These say they are mainly available for very expensive machines, like the hugely expensive Apple Lisa, and will not become popular. Why, they say, use a mouse when you can simply press a key for the required function, and they predict that mice will become extinct in 1984. That's just complete nonsense. They were never popular for the Spectrum, though. No, there were three main mice for the Spectrum, but there just wasn't the, the storage and RAM to run a proper um, icon system on a Spectrum. I know there were attempts at it, but they, they just what the machine wasn't powerful enough to do, what say, what the Amiga did and have a proper workbench stroke desktop. the new games then and we're taking this from adverts in the magazine the first one i saw was this phoenix from mega dodo software this is a fabulous version of the arcade game and it's only 16k i bought this mail order when i saw this and i wasn't disappointed i think this is the only version of the game that has all the levels from the arcade everyone skipped the music intro of course and then we get the first level with the player having only single shots, and then the next level where rapid fire is introduced, and then there are two levels of eggs, which hatch into birds, and finally the mothership. What a fantastic game. I agree. I used to love playing Phoenix. That version of it, it, it was absolutely brilliant. I forgot until, I, w I went back and played it, when you told me about this uh, part of the uh, show, and I really enjoyed it. I always play it on easy, though. It was accurate, it was fun, it was... not quite. It's not quite as hard as the arcade, is it? The mothership doesn't scroll down, which it does on the arcade, which... that That's a big help. And here's an advert for Gridrunner. Typical Llamasoft humour there, with silly names. Salamander and Lamsoft are linked by one man, the legend that is Jeff Minter. Interestingly, it says, coming soon, Laser Zone, but if you flip the page, the Lamasoft advert says you can already buy it. Let's have a quick go on Grid Runner then. I've reviewed this before, and it's a sort of centipede variant with added elements like horizontal and vertical firing lasers. For a 16k game, it's not bad. The action is fast, and it feels like an early arcade game. It does, but those those lasers are a pain. I really didn't like playing it. It's too hard, I want something easier than that. Kind of an easy game. It looks good, and you're right, for a 16k game it's really good. There's not a lot of flicker, which is good for a 16k game, because you can't double buffer the screen. And it it is fast, but I don't know. I found it hard to get into. I just kept getting killed by those things that fired the laser right across. Yeah, I mean, it, it was the about the third time I played it, I suddenly realised that you could move up and into the middle of the screen like centipede. Uh, I don't think I got far enough to realise that. <laughs> Oh, 
Christmas Gift Hunt and Christmas Mag Hunt, released in 2015-2016. These two games are the same, but with very minor differences. The sounds are different, and the gifts of the first one are swapped out for Spectrum magazines in the second. For this review, I'll show both of them. The original one was written by Stephen Nickel. You control Santa, who has to move around the town and collect all of the gifts lost during a storm. In his way are various festive themed nasties like snowmen, tin soldiers, and what looked like a very angry elf. But it is in fact Jack Frost. There are 80 gifts in all to find, and the town includes various places such as churches and parks. The game was written using Arcade Games Designer, and it's a nice simple game to play after opening all your presents and needing a bit of time to relax. You will find patches of ice that can only be entered in one direction and send you skating along, but apart from that, the enemies either move in simple horizontal vertical patterns, or in the case of Jack Frost, head straight for you. I kept wanting to get into the houses and buildings, but sadly that's not possible. If you want something to ease your festive frustration, this might be enough to see you until the next glass of alcohol arrives. Christmas Mag Hunt replaces the gifts with various Spectrum magazines. There's 1648, your Spectrum, Sinclair user, etc. Other than that, it's the same game. Not a bad little game, actually. Quite relaxing and easy to play. Moving on to hardware, and there's an advert for William Stewart Systems. This hardware is impossible to get hold of now, and I've never seen any on seller sites. I have got and reviewed Micro Command, the voice recognition system, Karar Microspeech, Cheetah Suite Talker, and a few more, but it would be good to get hold of these and see how they compare. According to a review in Personal Computer News, Big Ears and Chatterbox were not very good, and came with software that wasn't really complete. Big Ears would only let you hold 10 words in memory at a time, and it often didn't get them right, even after repeating them over three times to try and train it. Sounds pretty much like Micro Command to me. Nice pictures though. Anyway, we've jumped away from your computer. Let's get back. On to some of the game reviews then, and they review Bugaboo from Quicksilver, an interesting new game. This is a sort of quirky thing with a really strange control mechanic. You have to guide poor Bugaboo out of the cave and you can only make him jump left or right diagonally at different strengths. The caves are drawn really well, but I found myself either bouncing around a bit and then ending back down at the bottom, or just when I thought things were going well, a dragon would swoop down and kill me. I never really enjoyed this game back in the day. How about you, Jeff? I did enjoy it. I really liked it. Uh, it was a bit different. It's, it is frustrating, especially... There are two things about it that become frustrating. The intro scene is really, really good. But it goes on forever, so every time you load it up, you've got to go through it. If you could skip it, it would be great. Because the first time you watch it, I think that's great. And then, after that, it just get, it just starts to drag. And then the other thing is, the more you play it, the longer you play it for, the earlier the dragon arrives. So when you first start, it takes a little while for the dragon to arrive, and then you die, and you start again, and it's a bit quicker. And then after four or five goals, which you need to ever get out, then the dragon's basically appearing straight away. So do you think that's built into the game? Well, whether it's a bug or it's designed like that, it is built into the game. I didn't say it wasn't a built-in bug, but... It's definitely part of the game. I, th I think it's I think it's intentional. But the only way to stop it is to reset and reload the game, which means you've got to go through that intro again. Uh, I've got pretty high before. I've got I've got so I was probably possibly one or two good jumps off getting out. But it's 
that then either the dragon comes and eats you or you just hit something and drop all the way back to the floor and start crying. Which is very reminiscent of jumping jack, isn't it? If you, if you make one slight mistake, you can end up right down at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, you can be really near the top and all of a sudden you just go down and down and down and down. You think, no, I don't hit the boss. <laughs> Next we have Checkered Flag from Sion. When I first saw this game advertised, I was expecting pole position, or at least as near as the Spectrum could get. However, this is not an arcade game, it's more of a simulation. It has numerous tracks to drive around, and yes I did say drive rather than race. You're the only car on the track. You have different cars to choose from though, and then you get into the game, and I spent most of it trying to resist the urge to go full pelt round the corners. If you wanted that sort of game, you'd be disappointed. You have to choose the right gear and the right speed to get round the corners without crashing. You have to use the brake and then accelerate away. It's not hard not to crash, but if you were hoping for pole position like me, you'd be left a little bit annoyed. What did you think of this game, Jeff? About the same. It's... It's okay. You, you can load it up and go around a few tracks and go, is that it? It feels like a tech demo. A few things feel like tech demos. On to the top selling games then. At number 5 is Zoom by Imagine Software, a great game that I played incessantly. Try to save the people as bombers and tanks appear and swoop down towards you. A lot of players just shot the men though, just for the comic effect. I've never played it. I don't think I want to either. At number 4, Pool by Bugbite, a silent 16k game with flickery graphics. There were better games available, but pool was something new for the Spectrum. Yeah, isn't it almost impossible to pop balls in those games? I think I did play it back in the day, but not one that particularly stands out. It's not the kind of game I wanted to play. If I want to play pool, I'd rather play it on a proper pool table. At number three, Manic Miner from Bugbyte Software. Matthew Smith's classic platformer that broke the mould and set the standards. Arguably the best game on the Spectrum. At number two, talking of breaking standards, Jetpack from Ultimate Play the Game. This game showed just what the 16k machine could do. Can't argue with that. Absolutely superb, great game. Still go back and play it now, and I'm sure you do, Paul. Have you mentioned that you quite like it once or twice? And at number one, Flight Simulation from Scion. High in the charts, and not an arcade style game. Having a flight simulation on a 48k home micro was witchcraft back in the day. It was. I actually spent hours playing this, just flying around looking at lakes and always failing to land. Here's something that I think is unfair. There's a printer test and they test out professional printers and compare them to the ZX printer. That can't be right, surely? completely unfair. You'll be matching the ZX keyboard against a proper keyboard next. I mean, there is a smaller one, the Tandy, but that looks like the Alphacom 32. And all the prices are going to be way, way higher than the ZX printer. I don't think that's a good thing to do. I think it's unfair to try and compare a ZX printer, which was meant to just accompany your Spectrum for a bit of fun, with professional printers that are used in business. One interesting comment in the article states that the ZX printer can cause a disturbance in a domestic environment, especially late at night. Well, yes, it makes a noise, but I wouldn't call it loud, and I doubt it would cause any disturbance. Well, weren't they noisy? They were. I wouldn't say they were noisy. Not as noisy as a dot matrix printer, I wouldn't have thought. But the paper set on fire. Did it smell? Because it was all thermal, wasn't it? Oh, well, that, that was a lovely smell. <laughs> well... One person's lovely smell is another person's not so lovely smell. Keeping with the ZX printer for a while, how about using the ZX printer on your BBC? 
Yes, there's an interface that allows you to connect to the ZX printer to any 6502 based computer like the Dragon, Acorn, Vic or BBC. Why would anybody want to do that when those computers are perfectly capable of connecting to better quality printers? How bizarre. Typing time, and the first is called Quasimodo. Well, it's not, it's actually called Hunchy. It's a hefty typing, too, and I remember doing this over Christmas 1983. The game on the internet is the one that I typed out and submitted. Let's have a quick play then. It's not actually a bad game for a typing. It's got multiple levels, the control is fine once you get used to it, and obviously I have rose tinted glasses with this one. I spent ages typing it out, so it's great to play it again. It is a very good game. It, for a typing, it's superb. I probably think it's my favourite hunchback game on the spectrum, because the ocean game is just too difficult and I never got on with Punchy at all. It's a pity it's so short, it's only like four screens, isn't it? Which shows you how much I liked it. I kept playing it until I completed it, and I think it took me even like five or six goals. And it was like, oh, is that all? Other type ins include walls, or as the magazine calls it, bricks. This is a game by Graham Pierce, and it adds extra things to the usual breakout style game. You have to protect the red bricks at the bottom of the screen while trying to hit the bricks at the top. You can move your paddle at normal or double speed as well. Not a bad game, but I think it's something very similar to other things that have been done many, many times before. On to Bridge Builder. And this is a nice little game too from Simon Powell. Here you have to build a bridge by dropping segments from a helicopter. You have three lives in the form of life vests. It's tricky to line up your helicopter, but you soon get the hang of it. Some nice comic moments too. Not a bad game to try. Talking of type-ins, you'll probably be aware that some games started out as type-ins and were then later sold by companies either as a direct copy or a slightly modified version. Examples of this are Hunter Killer from Protech, which originally started as a type-in called U-Boat Hunt from your computer magazine, and of course Drachman, the type-in from your computer, which was later published with a few changes as 3D Bat Attack by Cheetahsoft. This magazine has another one, Worms. The advert in this magazine is for Lindhurst, with their game Magic Worm. Now. This game started life as a type-in in Sinclair programs by Michael Anderson, and it was later sold by KSoft and PolarSoft. According to Spectrum Computing, the game started as a type-in, and then PolarSoft sold it, and then it got updated and re-released as Magic Worm by KTEL. The games are basically the same, but with different authors attributed to them. Who copied who then, I wonder? So, with the main episode out of the way, there's so much more in this magazine to talk about. There's a double page advert for Richard Shepard software. The covers were better than the games. I wonder how many companies produce covers to try and sell poor games that they'd written. It's a difficult one, Matt. Um, I'll tell you what was worse, though. Worse because the cover was just art, and loads and loads of covers took artistic license with a game and made it look better than it was. 
what I think was worse than having a really good cover for a bad game is having screenshots from other systems on the back. Oh, yeah, that, that was common in the in the later part of the 80s. That was terrible. It was, yeah. I, you, you know what? You, you shouldn't judge a book by a, its cover, and you shouldn't judge a game by its cover either. But unless that cover has screenshots, and in tiny, tiny prints so small no one could ever read it, saying not actual, yeah, maybe from other systems, or not actually Spectrum screenshots. These are from the Amiga or the Atari ST. There's a double-page advert from Hewson. Plenty of games on offer, but they were early games and don't really stand up to scrutinisation when compared to what was appearing, and I'm talking about Ultimate Play the Game. You enjoyed Spectral Panic, Jeff, but how about looking at something neither of us has played? Maze Chase. It's a rubbish one, isn't it? It's a really rubbish one. It's a basic Pac-Man clone, yeah. Character movement and sticky controls, and when you die, all the dots you've previously eaten come back, which is very annoying. The ghosts are not really intelligent, but at least they don't just home in on you like other games. It's an early version, and most companies were doing similar sort of things back then. It did give me nostalgia, because I think the same guy wrote Maze Chase is Spectral Panic, and he basically has exactly the same intro and menu screens. He's just lifted one from the for the other. Next I want to talk about this, Jeff. Spectra Video. As a Spectrum owner, I would have flicked straight past this, but looking at it now, it, it looks amazing. There's disk drives, ROM ports, two different versions, one for the home use and one for business, a monitor, a printer, and everything matched. Now, if Sinclair had done something like this for the Spectrum, do you, do you think it would have made any difference to the way in which the machine went? How much did it cost, though? Why didn't Sinclair come up with something like that? I think the reason Sinclair didn't come up with something like that was the price. You're probably right, but you must admit it looks spectacular. You're right, it looks absolutely fantastic. They did it in their own way. Okay, they didn't do Exceptor, but they did do the interface too, and they did do their own joysticks. And they did they did a printer. They didn't do they didn't do a monitor, but it would just have been a portable telly anyway. Although there's two computers there. One has a joystick, one doesn't. Yeah, that one's the, they did two, one for gaming and one for business. Clearly the reason Sinclair didn't do it was price. I mean, it does look absolutely amazing. The inside cover had an ocean advert, with games that either never got released, had rapid name changes, or had a very limited release. Quite a few of these started life as Spectrum Games games. Yes, the company was called Spectrum Games, I'm not just repeating myself before they became Ocean Software. Some titles were not kept on, although in this advert, Ocean does show a few of them. There's Robotics, which was originally called Frenzy under Spectrum Games. I wonder why they changed their name. Could it possibly be that Quicksilver already had a berserk clone called Frenzy? It's not bad. You can only kill robots by hitting them in the head, and you can't fire diagonally. But they can, which makes it a bit tricky. Then there's Rescue. Now this never got released. At least not in any significant numbers to survive. And this game is missing in action. Ocean were not the only company to advertise games that never made it. But that's for another episode. And Caterpillar which did get a release, but was never sold under Ocean. Although yes, it's in their advert, but this one says just for the VIC-20. Now this is weird. DLT's Monster Challenge. Somehow I smell a con. Reading the advert, to win, you have to buy all six games. That's a total of £45. Each game has a clue, and if you find the clue you can put them together, and you could win £10,000. The first 10 to solve it will go in a head-to-head -head in a televised event in London. The game titles sound terrible, almost like type-ins, and they are all missing in action. Did they ever get released, I ask? The BBC versions are also not available. Twig Software only ever released these games, and nothing else. So maybe they never got released in the first place. Nothing comes up on the search engines when you search for DLT's Monster Challenge, and it seems there were only ever two adverts one in computer and video games, and this one. 
Do you see why I smell a con? Now I've seen a few adverts that attack Sinclair, either directly or indirectly, and here is one such advert, and I bet you can't guess what micro they're trying to sell you. Choosing a home micro, warning. Ooh, that's scary, better read it then. The pitfalls. Don't buy a computer that needs a lot of add-ons and extra software. It costs more in the long run. Um, okay, well, all home micros fall into that category, really. Make sure the PCB is made of good quality materials. I've no idea how you would check that without voiding the warranty. Hmm. Don't buy a games machine. It can only play games. Yeah, right. Make sure the system you choose has a growing software library. Fair enough, I suppose. Check it has high resolution colour. And it depends on what the definition is, but they say, if you take the vertical and horizontal resolutions and multiply them together, if it comes out less than 35,000, it isn't high resolution. Some computers claim to have a sound channel, but it's just a buzzer. Uh -huh, we'll get onto that later. It's important to have a good tactile keyboard. Uh, fair enough. You must have lots of RAM. Some companies lie. If it's less than 32K, think again. You must select a computer that uses Microsoft Basic. Okay. And your micro must be expandable, as you will later need things like a joystick or modem. Hang on, doesn't that contradict the first point? Anyway, and lastly, you must pick a micro that has utility programs. Okay, so let's address those one at a time, shall we? And have you guessed yet which machine they're trying to sell? Turning the page, and the micro is the Oric 1. Right. I thought you might be surprised by that. Where do I begin? The expansion point is invalid because they've already contradicted themselves. So the, onto the games part and well the Oric is a games machine. Games were written for it and they might have hoped, like Sinclair, that it would be used for business but it just wasn't powerful enough. A growing software library? Yeah okay, let's have a count then. The total count of Oric games in the Tossic archive comes to 1017. The equivalent Tossic archive for the Spectrum weighs in at well over 40,000. So let's see who wins that one, shall we? On to resolution, okay? The Spectrum's resolution is 256 by 192. Times those two together and you get 49,152, which is, by their definition, high resolution. The Auric comes in at 80,000, because its resolution is 400 by 200. Not sure it made any difference in games, though. Sound, well, that advert claims real sound, opposed to false sound then, really, okay. Well, the Auric has an AY chip, so yes, it's got three-channel sound. And yes, that would be better than the Spectrum's beeper, but the Spectrum has a speaker, not a buzzer. Keyboard, well, looking at the Auric, I prefer the Spectrum's dead flesh keyboard, to be honest. RAM, interesting on this, the Auric does indeed have 48k available to the user, and the Spectrum only has 32. The question is, was it ever used? Looking again at the Tosek archive, there are only three games that go beyond 32k. So not really used then, so, so an invalid point. On to the basic question, and I think that's down to personal choice, really. Utility programs? Well, bring it on, the Spectrum had loads. Anyway, I'll leave this here now because it's the end of the episode. I think that's it. We're at the end of the episode. We hope you enjoy your festive period. And remember, if you get a present you don't like, and the person who gave it to you is in the same room, this is how you're supposed to react. Thanks for watching.